Good afternoon, everyone. Um, well, good morning to some of you. Good evening to some others, depending on where you're joining us from. Um, I know we have a lot of people from Europe. Uh, I have some colleagues from um, from Hong Kong. Uh, I think Marcus might be here from South Africa. So uh, we have people from literally uh, all around the world. Um, so thank you very much for uh, for joining us. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Bidisha Banerjee. Um, uh, I teach at the uh, Education University of Hong Kong. Uh, and I'm working on this project with uh, two wonderful colleagues who I'll introduce in a second, who many of you probably know already. Um, so um, our, our project, as you know, is called Thanatic Ethics, the Circulation of Bodies in Migratory Spaces. Uh, I'll put a link to our website in the chat box in case uh, you want to uh, get more information. Um, this is uh, the first uh, uh, webinar uh, we've put together, so we're, we're organizing organizing two uh, webinar series. Um, this is the first talk of the first series. So we have two more coming up in, uh, in November and December. Uh, and then three more um, in uh, next year, early next year. Um, so, um, so please um, drop us an email if you uh, are interested and want to be put on the mailing list. Um, uh, so um, and and check out our website and let us know if you're um, if you'd like to be involved with the project in any way. Uh, let me quickly introduce uh, my collaborators. Um, so uh, we have Dr. Judith Mizrahi Barak, um, who is uh, associate professor at Paul Valéry University in Montpellier, France. Um, and also uh, Dr. Thomas Lacroix, who's a senior researcher at Meso Francaise Oxford. Um, so uh, I'll hand it over to, to Thomas to introduce our speaker for this afternoon. And maybe I'll stop sharing the screen. Thank you, guys. Thomas. <clears throat> so thank you, Bidi Shah. So, yeah. So I'm very, very pleased to introduce uh, our first speaker for this uh, webinar. And uh, so, where is he? Antoine Pecou is a professor of sociology at the University Paris 13. Uh, so the, um, I don't know how to pronounce it. It's, it really sounds weird, University Paris 13. But um, it's, he's a, a research associate at Sciences Po in Paris. And uh, so Antoine is uh, doctor, has a PhD from the University of Oxford. He uh, initially worked on the Turkish entrepreneurs in Berlin, but then he had a position for a long time, for a few years, at the UNESCO's program of international migration. And then he became very famous for being a specialist of the, the role of international organizations in the uh, in the shaping of a, a, a governance of uh, international migration. And he worked extensively on the role, of, more specifically of IOM in this process. And then you of course have many other area of expertise, but um, uh, I won't uh, take, your, take more time and I will give you the floor for your, your presentation today. Mm. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Thomas, and thank you very much to all the organizers of the seminar for inviting me for this first session uh, today. Uh, it's great to be online with so many people from all over the world. It's a, it's a, it's a very nice experience. Uh, so I'm going to present um, a paper that is part of a collective project I recently coordinated on uh, migrant death. So I'm going to share uh, my screen. Uh, hopefully, you will all be able to uh, see uh, what I'm uh, referring to. Um, OK, so let me just, uh, there we go. Um, Uh, yes, so the, the, the ongoing project is this one was published as a special issue in American Behavioral Scientist a few uh, a few months ago, a special issue with quite a few researchers 
uh, all working on migrant death. Uh, I can see that Carolina Kobudanski is with us online today. So hello, Carolina, and Carolina was one of the contributors to this uh, special issue. So if you want you know, to have some further reading after the seminar, that may be an option. And in case uh, you don't have the time to read all the papers, I just want to draw your attention to the Border Criminologist blog, the Oxford-based Border Criminologist blog, in which we published a short a summary, so to say, of all papers. It's ongoing, so you can see quite a few papers on uh, board death. Again, one is by Carolina, who is with us uh, today. So just a few um, observations to contextualize you know, the collective dimension of this of this work. And so basically, um, uh, the topic I would like to discuss this morning is not really about migrant death. It's about how we count and therefore how we represent uh, migrant death. So perhaps uh, I, I can make a few observations here. Uh, the first one is that uh, perhaps it's worth making distinction between you know, analyzing migration dynamics per se, for example, migrant death, and on the one hand, and on the other hand, analyzing the way those migration realities are framed, presented, counted, discussed, represented in a kind of constructivist perspective by different actors including by the media, by NGOs, by international organizations, uh, and so on. So that's perhaps a key distinction also because from a policy perspective, it, I mean, we all know that policy do not necessarily react to migration dynamics per se, they rather react to the representation or the perceptions of migration dynamics. So perhaps it's worth stressing that I'm not working on migrant death you know, in themselves. I'm rather working on the way different actors perceive migrant death and this imp the impact this may have on policy uh, making. So that's perhaps the first, the first point. Uh, a second point is about numbers. Uh, we live in an evidence-based policy world, as you all know, uh, in which numbers play a key role. And here I'm interested perhaps in uh, the way numbers can be very ambivalent. Uh, they can prove many different things. They can be used to uh, showcase different aspects of reality. And when I will discuss this issue of counting migrant death, uh, I think in the background we have this, you know, this, this, this context in which you know, policies claim to be evidence-based and therefore numbers can be extremely significant, uh, both to legitimize, but also to criticize um, immigration policy and any kind, other kind of, of policy, of course. Uh, so that, that is perhaps a second observation is actually to take the evidence based seriously and to say, well, okay, uh, what, kind of, um, what kind of data do we have uh, where does the data come from? Who counts the data? And to what extent is the data, how is it constructed? As we will see, statistics are never neutral, obviously. They always rely on a specific way of understanding reality, and therefore numbers can you know, uh, be interpreted in very different ways. Uh, and perhaps the third point, uh, the preliminary remark I would like to make, is about you know, the politicization of migration. Uh, as you all know, even though you come from all over the world, but I guess many of you have heard about the ongoing you know, migrant and refugee crisis in the Euro Mediterranean region. This has contributed to highly politicized migration. It was already heavily politicized before, of course, but it was even further politicized. It became really an issue for high politics. And uh, the question I would like to ask is how do we play with this idea of politicization of migration? Um, namely, the fact that some issues be become he heavily politicized, but on the other hand, the assumption in this paper is that politicization also leads to its counter dynamic, a, a depolitization of data and of migration. And so we have to study the interplay of what is politicized, what is deemed politically relevant, and what is depoliticized, what is sort of made technical or apolitical. Um, so this is the kind of ongoing uh, ref, you know, work that I try to, 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 I mean, that constitutes the background of this presentation this morning. All right. Uh, okay. So perhaps the starting point, I mean, the few starting point of the, of the study, why we, we, I mean, I should, of course, add, I'm sorry, I haven't done this before, but the paper I wrote uh, uh, for, this, for this, this special issue was jointly written by my colleague and co-writer, uh, Charles uh, Heller. You can see it here. I don't think he's with us this, today, but of course, it's a joint uh, paper by Charles and myself. So I will not only uh, speak about you know, my own work, but also about the work of Charles, who is you know, one of the leading researcher and also uh, activist on this topic of migrant death, at least in the Euro-Mediterranean uh, context. So why did Charles and uh, did we start, Charles and myself start to work on this? Uh, of course, like all of you, I guess, we went through countless uh, media reports like this one, 
uh, you probably all saw this, that's from the New York Times, but you could probably find thousands of similar articles in which you know, global media talked at length about uh, migrant death in the Mediterranean Sea and systematically relied on numbers, arguing, well, no, this year was more deadly than last year. There was a peak in terms of death uh, in August or whatever. So constantly you know, being exposed, not only as researchers, but also as citizens and simply you know, people who read the media every day, constantly being exposed to numbers, figures, facts uh, about migrant death. And so we thought, well, you know, it could be interesting to uh, look at you know, where do these numbers come from and um, how are they produced? Because obviously it's extremely difficult at first sight to count the number of migrant death. Um, uh, probably won't have time to go into the details, but if you study migrant death, you know that they often take place far away from you know, visible areas. They take place in the desert, for example, at the US-Mexico border, or they take place at high sea. And therefore it's very difficult to assess the exact numbers uh, of death, but nevertheless, we were confronted as researchers and as citizens as you know, countless, very specific, precise uh, data. So we asked ourselves, you know, how come we have this data? Where does it come from? Uh, who counts? With what criteria? What methodology? Uh, and so on. In the meantime, as uh, Thomas uh, just mentioned, uh, I was also interested, that was another starting point of the research. I'm also interested in the work of the International Organization for Migration. I can uh, briefly advertised a recent book I just published on this uh, organization, which is now a UN agency, a UN migration agency, as it is called, um, that works on basically you know, it, what it calls you know, better migration management or improved migration governance at the global level. And I've, been, I've long been intrigued by the way international organization can work on such a highly politicized topic and a topic that really divides states uh, between sending countries, re uh, receiving countries, and so on. So I was quite interested. I've long been interested in the work of the IOM. Um, if I'm not going to go into the details. We could have you know, at least another session on this organization. Uh, but this was, my, the, the, this was part of my interest in the topic because at some point, uh, let me see if I can. Why can I? Yes, because at some point, IOM launched the Missing Migrants Project. Uh, this is the website uh, from the IOM uh, website, Missing Migrants Project, in which they uh, started counting migrant uh, death. This started, if I'm correct, in 2015 or 16, um, uh, so four, five, six years ago, approximately. And it was very interesting to observe this because um, IOM started working on a very sensitive uh, topic, migrant death, and IOM has a long history of a you know, complex relationship to uh, specifically Western you know, global north uh, states. They are the main funders of IOM. They usually ask or use IOM as a kind of actor in externalizing migration control. IOM has been heavily criticized for ages by NGOs because it plays a role in, for example, reinforcing border control in the global south with money from the global north, for example. And uh, therefore, uh, IOM, when it started counting uh, migrant death, uh, I asked myself, now, how come they do this? How come they play with this extremely sensitive uh, data? Because you can easily see migrant death as an outcome of migration control, obviously. And given that IOM is part of the migration control apparatus, how come do they both, on the one hand, reinforce migration control, and on the other hand, count the deaths that occur precisely because of reinforced migration control. So it gave, you know, it made for, for a kind of you know, research question, um, how does an international organization uh, invest such a sensitive uh, issue? Also because in the background, if you study international organizations, you know that very often uh, they are uh, what is sometimes called knowledge agencies or knowledge organizations one of the primary role is to provide uh, data deemed relevant and accurate that is used by researchers, by governments uh, all over the world. Whatever the topic you work on, whether it's human rights, poverty, development, whatever, you'll end up working with World Bank data or UN data or whatever. So IOs have a very strong role in providing the data. And when a UN agency starts counting migrant theft, we could assume uh, that it would actually become the lead agency and the lead source of data on migrant uh, death. So that was you know, some of the uh, you know, sort of starting points we, we discussed. Um, in terms of the analytical framework, I mean, we see statistics as inherently political. Uh, I think Foucault himself mentioned in one of his 
uh, writings that you know, there's a shared etymology between state and statistics. The two words actually share uh, a same uh, etymology. And statistics, to some extent, is the knowledge of the state, you know, what the state knows about its own population. Uh, and of course, you know, Foucault and Foucault followers have worked a lot on how knowledge, statistics, facts, figures, number enable uh, governments to actually control their territory or their population. Uh, so we work from that uh, basis, arguing that uh, statistics enable governments to address uh, social and political issues. But the corollary of this is that some issues are never taken into account because they're not counted. Uh, and to a large extent, this is the case with migrant death. Uh, countries have a lot of data about immigration to their country. Uh, they know how many migrants arrived and uh, they estimate the number of regular, irregular migrants uh, and so on. But there's no state or national government data on migrant death. So no country has measured or counted the number of people who died trying to reach their territory. So that's a kind of dark hole in statistics. And therefore, uh, when, you, when you want to disregard an issue or when you want to actually you know, silence an issue, the best thing to do is not to collect data. And it appears as something that does not happen. So we have this deep you know, uh, relationship between power and knowledge and politics and statistics. And therefore, this was the kind of background of the paper. We're interested in understanding how, at some point, knowledge becomes uh, produced uh, on a sensitive topic by whom, given that states that are the primary source of data and statistics for their country, states do not seem to play a role in those uh, statistics about uh, migrant death. Uh, so different reasons why we got interested uh, in this. And so we asked ourselves, how did it all start? I mean, who had, you know, who had the first, uh, who was the first actor to first have the idea of counting migrant death? And as far as we know, uh, this was, uh, let me just try uh, to move to another, yes. This was first initiated by an NGO called United, United for Intercultural Action. Uh, they started 1993, so that's 27 years ago, a long time, in the early 90s. Uh, the context, of course, is important. The early 90s is an you know, immediate first Cold War period, and it's the beginning of you know, the, 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 the tough you know, measures to fight irregular immigration throughout the world, both at the US-Mexico border, for example, and across uh, Europe, especially in the, with the East-West, uh, in the East-West context. And at this early 90s, this NGO sort of invented, so to say, this practice of counting uh, migrant death. So what they produced is a list of death, what they call list of death. So if you go on the on their website, you can actually download uh, this list of death here, which you can see here. And what you get is, oh, it's, uh, oh, it's difficult to actually, no, here we go, sorry. Uh, so what you get is a kind of you know, Excel sheet, so to say, uh, in which you have literally uh, thousands of entries with all the migrant death they have collected. Uh, so the last one was April, 2019, um, and you have about 46,000 documented death of refugees and migrants. It's only in Europe. Uh, this presentation will focus on Europe, but a similar presentation, I guess, could be made on other regions, especially the US-Mexico border. But that's, no, I don't have the time and the knowledge to, to present everything. That's really for Europe. And basically, they frame this as Fortress Europe. Fortress Europe, as you may know, was a key word throughout the 90s to refer to the way Europe was progressively closing itself to irregular migration through patent uh, patterns of, of, and policies of migration uh, control. And they list uh, basically the, the, the death. Uh, so you can see here, you've got you know, the number, the name, the gender, the age, the region of origin, the, the reason why the migrant died, the source. And they collect this from a wide network of you know, NGOs, local associations, media, and so on. And they collect all this information, uh, piling up all the data for over, uh, for, for over the past 27 uh, years. So that's an interesting you know, attempt. You can see that this NGO started a long time ago, well before we started as academics working on this topic. Uh, and they actually started producing uh, data. And what is important is that statistics uh, never measure a pre-existing reality. They measure something. And by measuring this reality, they actually transform this reality into a specific issue. So to some extent, uh, this is a question I'll go back to. 
the question is, you know, to what extent do they contribute by counting to creating a phenomenon that is called a migrant uh, death or death at the borders, that different terms uh, circulate. So that was one of the first, uh, or as far as we know, the very first occurrence of, of counting migrant death in the European context. And uh, a few years later, uh, in the early 2000s, um, there was a well-known map that was first published initially by a leftist newspaper called Le Monde Diplomatique, whom some of you uh, may know, uh, a very uh, famous map that was widely uh, circulated. Um, it was done in partnership with um, the network Migre-Europe and our colleague uh, Olivier Clochard and Philippe Rekasevich. Uh, those two actually produced this map uh, in which they actually transformed the Excel sheet we just saw into a much more visual representation uh, in which you can uh, literally see uh, where death happens, how many deaths were, and you can have all kinds of data on you know, um, the color refers to the type of death, whether it's uh, drowning, whether it's uh, accidents, uh, whether it's you no know, other sources, uh, other reasons for dying. And the, the size of the circle obviously refers to the number uh, of people uh, in specific places around Europe. And the novelty of this is that, you know, you could just juxtapose death at the border, literally, for example, between Spain and Morocco, and also death inside uh, Europe, for example, uh, in uh, big cities, in airports or other places uh, like this. I'll, I'll come back uh, to this. That was the second sort of key step into this, this, this progressive construction of data uh, on uh, migrant uh, death. Uh, so, and there are many other initiatives, I'm not going to go into the details, but with the crisis over the past years, quite a few other actors, uh, in the, some journalists, researchers, other NGOs, started, you know, in the same way, uh, accumulating data on migrant death because it became a big issue. But the two first, uh, you know, the two first occurrences of, those, of this, this type of statistics are the two I just showed you, uh, the United uh, List and the map produced uh, by uh, colleagues and published uh, in the mode uh, diplomatic. Uh, so uh, obviously um, those what is interesting here is that we have a, a, a practice that was first established or invented by NGOs and if we go back to uh, to the to the to the um, uh, to the um, sorry to the website, to the missing migrants, IOM missing migrants website, we see roughly the same type of, uh, of, of practice. I mean, we see a map. Uh, we can actually go, if you want, you can play with the data, you can look at different uh, areas and zoom on the map. Uh, it's global, it's not only Europe centered, it's global, but roughly speaking, they have the same idea. They produce a map counting migrant death with roughly the same type of, of, uh, of intention, uh, showing how many people died uh, where. And they actually uh, also, I'm going to change, sorry, I have to change uh, what I'm sharing. Um, they also produced, you can, from their website, you can, if you want, download the list of data. Uh, so this is how it looks, it's an Excel sheet, which is accessible uh, for free online from their website. And it's roughly the same idea than United. Basically, you have you know, the number of people who died, uh, the date, the location, the cause of the death, uh, and so on. So IOM basically is doing exactly what NGOs have been doing for the past you know, 30, 25 uh, years uh, or so. Uh, sort of building upon a practice that was established by NGOs and now that is performed by IOs. And of course, IOM has greater resources and it does this in a much more sort of professional way, so to say, because they have greater resources. And there's evidence that they are progressively taking over. If you go through the media reports I just showed you at the beginning, you will see that very often the data comes from IOM. Uh, it's uh, actually, the, the, this data is becoming the most reliable and most widely quoted source of data on uh, migrant uh, death. But what's interesting is that this IOM initiative is not born out of nothing. It's born out of previous NGO initiatives. And actually, there's a lot of work on this. If you look at you know, in political sciences, uh, you've got interesting work. Uh, John Bolley, for example, an American political scientist, has this idea um, that, to some extent, new policy issues are invented by civil society. 
uh, for example, they take the issue of the environment, for example, invented by NGOs and civil society groups, and progressively the issue is taken over by international organizations, uh, and then at the end, the first stage, that it goes at the level of states. So states, so to say, I mean, what states do is never invented by states or by governments. It's actually, on the long run, invented by civil society, then moved to IOs, and then to state. So if you look at issue like you know, gender equality or environmental protection, you can see this sort of three-step movement. Now it's a big issue for many governments, but it used to be primarily an NGO issue, a civil society issue, and it was legitimized, taken over by you know, UN organizations, UN agencies, which actually then prompted states uh, to take the initiative to work on those topics. So you can see this move from you know, NGO practice, NGO uh, initiatives, and then uh, progressively uh, through IOs, perhaps going to states. So we may be in the middle of the process, you know, this, no, this practice of counting mag and death taken over by IOs, like IOM, and perhaps on the long run, this will become a state of practice um, as well. So we have continuity to some extent, but we also have uh, big differences. Um, let me go back to uh, the web. Yes, so here, if you look at this, um, this, this, this map and you want to zoom, for example, to a specific area, you say you're interested in Europe, you will click on Europe, and here you will learn that in 2020 to this year, you only have 69 deaths of migrants in Europe. Uh, so it's a bit strange uh, because if you look at the data by NGOs, uh, Europe is a big important place in terms of migrant death. But IOM actually uh, so sort of you know, says, well, in Europe, it's no big deal. There are only a few dozens of uh, migrant deaths. So actually they, they play with regions, they play with the geography and by contrast, if you want to look, if you want to find information about the death in the euro mediterranean region, you have to click on Mediterranean migrants in the Mediterranean Sea. And then you have actually many more. Uh, you have more than 700 migrant deaths. Most of them, as you can see, are in Northern Africa, uh, Libya especially. Uh, but so the map is not, I mean, the distinction between the two maps is interesting. Uh, for example, on this map, which is about the Mediterranean Sea, you actually have migrant death occurring in Greece, for example, there's the circle with 33 deaths in Greece. Um, and you don't really see the difference with this one uh, in which you know, there's the 47 here, that's the Balkan routes, I guess, but Greece somehow is put in the Mediterranean Sea. Um, so they actually play with data. And this is precisely where the politics of data comes in. Uh, you actually position the death on the map, uh, depending upon geopolitical factors. Roughly speaking, to make a long story short, what IOM does says, basically, it says that migrant death is a southern problem, or it's a problem for sending or transit uh, states. It's not a European problem. And therefore, uh, IOM is willing to help those transit states, for example, in Northern Africa or in Turkey, uh, to uh, address the issue of migrant death. So basically, it delocalizes uh, migrant death. Uh, we talk a lot in migration studies about the externalization of migrant, con migration control, sending states, receiving states, having to take over the job of controlling irregular migration. So here we have a kind of externalization of data on migrant death, moving the data uh, from the heart of Europe uh, to the periphery, uh, so to say. So that's an interesting um, move. And precisely, you know, we, I was talking initially about the politics of data. How can intergovernmental organization address such sensitive data, well, one of the answers is actually by moving this data outside the global north and therefore avoiding any kind of direct criticism of the responsibilities of receiving states in the heart uh, of Europe. So that's one of the uh, first big uh, difference. And the second difference we can observe, uh, I'll go back if I can uh, to the list of death, which is quite interesting. And we're not going to roll down all the list because there are far too many. But perhaps if you can uh, see on the screen, the second line here, uh, it's a good example. You've got a young boy, Ali, 18 years old from Afghanistan, who died in Geneva because he committed suicide in a shelter for unaccompanied minor uh, migrants. Uh, so that's you know, what United considers a migrant death. Uh, it's a suicide by a young uh, minor uh, immigrant uh, because of bad, it says, because of bad housing conditions in Geneva. 
so here you have migrant death really occurring in the heart of uh, Europe, in one of Europe's richest uh, cities, Geneva. And it's the death that occurs following a suicide. And this is not at all what IOM counts. Uh, IOM completely excludes this type of, uh, uh, of death, and it counts only basically shipwrecks and this or, or people who die in the desert in the uh, in the mid in the in North Africa, uh, for example. So the question this raises, which is a classical question with statistics, is the question of categories, right? Um, if you want to count migrant death, first you have to define what the migrant death is, and Right now, at this stage, there's no uh, clear-cut definition. Uh, it's the same with everything. You know, if you want to count unemployed uh, unemployment, you need to know exactly what unemployment means. And as we know, if you study labor sociology, you know that different definitions of unemployment, depending on how long you're unemployed and this type of, of factors. It's the same with migrant death. You have to create a category, a uh, meaningful statistical category, and decide what is inside the category and what is left outside. And so, roughly speaking, um, NGOs have an inclusive category. They consider, uh, as they say, let me see if I can go back to this. Uh, oh, sorry, no, it's this one. Uh, they consider here that all the people who are uh, victims of the restrictive policies of Portuguese Europe should be included. And so there are debates, for example, if you're in a regular migrant, you have you work on the black, you know, you're, uh, without the status, you're under, you're under protected, and you work, so let's say, in the construction sector, you are badly protected, you don't have a helmet, you don't have, you know, the right protection because you're undocumented, and you have an accident and you die. Is this a consequence of restrictive policies or not? To some extent, yes, of course, because the reason why you work in such an underprotected way is because you're irregular, and the reason why you're irregular is because you have restrictive policies in Europe that ban people from a legal access to the territory and the labor market. So, of course, it's a migrant death, uh, but is it uh, border death? It's not quite clear. It depends where you put the border. Um, IOM has a fairly, as we can see here, literal understanding or geopolitical understanding of the border. It counts people literally at the border. The four here is actually the channel so the border between uh, between France and the UK, um, whereas other maps, uh, like if, if I can manage to go back to the other map, um, sorry, I keep struggling to, to move um, this, uh, the, the, yeah, uh, the, the, yep. uh, the other map, um, I'll make it. Um, Apologize. Uh, yes, this one uh, has a much more inclusive understanding of the border because it considers, for example, that if you die in Paris, uh, basically it's lots of the, many of the migrants who die in Paris actually die at the Charles de Gaulle airport, for example, because they are kept either because they are expelled expelled from the country in a brutal way and therefore they die, or because they have to stay in detention centers inside uh, the airport. That's a completely different understanding of the border. The border is a kind of you know social. Uh, border inside uh, the country, a legal border uh, as well. And of course, you can, depending on how you frame the border, and there are many ways of framing the border, as you know, critical border studies have made clear, uh, you actually reach a very different conclusion about what is migrant uh, death. So you actually you have this, this you know, playing with categories, playing with numbers, playing with the geography, and therefore, uh, what could be called depoliticizing the data on uh, migration. So uh, I'm not sure uh, uh, how many minutes do I still have? Um, I've been talking for too long. No, well, is it still okay? Five to ten minutes. Five to ten minutes. Okay, great. So I will conclude uh, with this, those five, ten minutes uh, I have left. Uh, so perhaps the conclusion in more general terms is about um, what could be called the threatening nature of those deaths. Uh, I mean, if you study anthropology of death, for example, uh, you know that in literally all societies, um, death somehow need to be taken care of. Uh, there are all kinds of rituals uh, that enable societies to cope with uh, death, especially a brutal or violent death, have to be, you know, you have to make sense of those deaths. And this usually makes for all kinds of ceremonies to celebrate or uh, to pay tribute to uh, the people uh, who died. So from that perspective, from this sort of anthropology of death perspective, 
migrant death are kind of you know, difficult to deal with because very often they take place far away um, at the border, at the periphery of the country. We don't know quite well whether it's our responsibility from Europe to the European side or others' responsibility. Usually states, of course, as you know, they blame the smugglers and the traffickers for those deaths. They completely disregard their own responsibility. And so we have those deaths that actually have a kind of in-between status. Um, and to some extent, you know, uh, there's a big literature on this, obviously. Um, those dead people can sort of haunt, so to say, um, the, 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 the societies. And you have somehow to, to make sense of this. Um, and in this presentation, I tried to, to illustrate two ways of making sense of this. The first is the NGO civil society way, which count migrant death to, as you could understand, blame Fortress Europe and say basically to governments, well, you're responsible for this. You have to take uh, into account uh, those deaths and you have to do something uh, to prevent those deaths. So here, going back to the evidence-based uh, issue I initially talked about, we have a way of using the evidence against the dominant political trend because uh, the data, the numbers are used not to legitimize uh, policy, but to criticize policy. So it's a kind of sort of counter statistics sort of way, so to say. There's a book published by, by French sociologist, um, I can give you the reference after, which is called Statactivism, a contraction of statistics and activism. And that says that in some cases, uh, sort of you know, activism, uh, civil society initiatives can rely on numbers precisely because we live in a world dominated by a kind of you know, neoliberal pattern of governmentality in which numbers play a key role. So from that perspective, NGO use numbers as a way of contesting, uh, making sense of these numbers as a way of contesting uh, immigration policy. Whereas IOM sort of say is the counterpart to this, it uses those numbers, but to neutralize so to say the, 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 politi the political threat or the social threat they represent. Basically, IOM argument is that, well, it's an issue for improved governance. Uh, we have to work with uh, receiving states, uh, with sending states, with transit states, and we have to help, especially uh, states in the periphery of Europe to address uh, migrant death. And this you know, bet better or improved cooperation or governance will actually enable um, a prevention or reduction of migrant death. So it's two, I mean, there's the same activity, counting, um, the same outcome, you have maps, you have Excel sheets with the list of death, but you have very different political uh, intentions, very different realities that both play with this kind of threatening aspect of migrant death. Um, and indeed, when you follow the news throughout the crisis, now things have a bit calmed down, but throughout the crisis, you had this idea that shipwrecks or migrant death were always sort of challenging, especially EU uh, authorities or, it, or the Italian government, the Greek government, because every time a ship crack would happen, it would actually urge the government to do something. Uh, and there's not much they could do, at least in the current context, unless they completely change the political framework, which, which is unlikely. And therefore, we have to make sense of those deaths and provide them with a meaning, a social or political meaning. And that's what both NGOs and IOs do, but with very different, different intentions. And this results into different categories, different ways of framing the, the geographical um, embeddedness of the death, where does it happen, who is responsible, what country is responsible, uh, and so on. So very different ways of framing uh, those uh, deaths. And perhaps the open question I can conclude with uh, is that the question is what will happen on the long run? Um, if you follow this three steps move I just mentioned, uh, the next step would be for governments to actually start producing their own data uh, on this. Uh, just like they produce um, data on uh, other patterns of other types of death, you know, for medical reasons, whatever, um, and so on. So they would actually start producing their own data, but with what categories, with what implications? Uh, and so perhaps you know, the next step is you know, what will become the dominant pattern of counting, defining, and apprehending migrant death? Uh, what will be the dominant way of uh, producing knowledge on this? And depending on the pattern of knowledge that is selected, of course, you have very different implications, social and political uh, implications. Uh, so I think I'm going to conclude uh, here with this uh, open questions. Uh, I have no answer about what's going uh, to happen, but I think it's very interesting to observe how an issue became an issue uh, on the long run over the past three uh, decades and how this issue is still being because of this heavily 
its heavily contested nature, it's still being negotiated and renegotiated by different actors that intervene on this issue with very different intentions and therefore with very different ways of treating, addressing, uh, apprehending or constructing uh, the topic. Okay, thanks. So I think I will stop here uh, and I'm happy to, to, to discuss uh, the, 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 the uh, to discuss some of the points uh, I've been I've been raising. Thanks a lot for your attention. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much, Antoine. Uh, it's a wonderful talk and uh, showing how it's how the who deciding who is a, a migrant death and where. Uh, it's happening, it has become a, a political issue, I'd it's, say, it's, it's amazing. And uh, yeah, you, you, you really make your point saying that IOM wants to occupy the space, wants to become the legitimate uh, voice on this issue. And it's not even statistics. If I remember well, the missing migrant is also the name of, uh, of a project run by uh, NGOs as well, or a journalist NGO, I think. So it uh, don't think yes. the UN deliberately choose this name to replace something which mm -hmm. was ongoing already, so. Yes, yes, no, there's clearly a matter of legitimacy here. And because the issue is very simple, if you let NGOs produce the data, they will become the dominant actor and they will impose their own critical understanding of this data. So you have to replace them by a kind of more neutralized, depoliticized uh, data. There are many other initiatives uh, could be interesting to perhaps to add, especially this is a big initiative by the Red Cross, um, the International Red Cross Committee, uh, who is, you know, has a long experience about disappearances and people who disappear in situations of conflict. They've been working on this also. And that's also very interesting. I, have, I haven't worked on this yet. Uh, but it's very interesting precisely because the Red Cross has this long-standing neutrality uh, towards governments and therefore they address the topic in an extremely neutral way, which is also a, way, a very interesting way of framing uh, the topic. Mm -hmm. okay. So thank you very much. So mm -hmm. I, will, I will open, uh, open the floor to questions. So I suggest people who want to, to ask a question, uh, just uh, yeah, sh show me in the chat uh, who wants to talk and I will... Uh, and maybe Bidisha, you can, is, is that you opening or shutting off the, the, the microphones or no? Who, who's in charge of the... Uh... Uh, no, people are just managing their own uh, microphones, but uh, yeah. yeah, people can raise their hands. So Judith has raised yeah. her hand for a question. Yes. So, yeah, <laughs> go. Yes, thank you, Antoine. That go was a, a wonderful talk and it's wonderful to have it first. In fact, because it really sets the, uh, the situation for the, the following you know, webinars. I have a question about the terminology, um, because we, uh, we know that the, the words emigrants and immigrants um, have become less and less used, contrary to you know, why the, the word migrant has become predominantly used. So was there a moment when in the public discourse um, in the among the NGOs, etc. Was there a moment when that shift actually occurred, and is it visible? In fact, when when it occurred, you mean the move from the I mean the, the establishment the of the migrants as the dominant category? Immigrant. Yeah, the move from the yes. words immigrant immigrant to the mm -hmm. word migrant. Yes. Uh, well, I, I mean, I'm not sure uh, about this, but I think to some extent that's also a result of statistics, uh, much but a much older process. Uh, because of course, governments have very different ways of calling uh, foreigners. I mean, some will yeah, call them foreign okay. nationals, some will call them immigrants, some will call them guest workers. There are countless ways, depending on the status of those foreigners. Of course, uh, you have different ways of calling them. Uh, in the US, I think they use the term illegal aliens for irregular migrants, for example, which is yet another way of calling uh, the people. Um, so uh, I suppose I know the word migrants has become very popular as a kind of catch-all uh, concept, uh, which enables, especially IOs, the, the work here is done largely by the UN, UN uh, Department of Economic and Social Affairs, UNDESA. They produce uh, global statistics on migration, and therefore they need a category uh, which uh, which became the migrant category to actually refer to you know migrant workers, uh, foreign students, um, uh, permanent uh, immigrants in, for example, Australia or Canada, uh, and so on. Um, and I would say I would say that immigrant and immigrant is not. I mean, these were also 
fairly artificial uh, categories. Um, we do not have, I mean, some countries say foreign, foreign residing uh, citizens, for example, for immigrants and so on. So um, I think there are countless words used by governments uh, for the purpose of you know, national statistics. And whenever you try to move up and to have a kind of global picture, you need a much broader concept. And indeed, the concept of migrant is, at least to some extent, partly the result of this, this, this quest for a kind of you know, global category in which we can put all the different foreigners we can, we can think of. Mm -mm. Yeah, no, of course, it's, it's very heavily you know, politically yes. charged. And mm -hmm. if you take yes. the word ref refugee can mean one yes. thing and almost mm -hmm. the opposite. Yes, absolutely. Yes, yes. No, but when we were, the term migrant is very complex. When we, uh, when I was working at UNESCO, remember we had countries that say, well, we have no migrants. Uh, we have, for example, permanent settlers. Uh, countries like Canada would say, well, we don't know the migrant category. We have people who arrive. They are either guest workers, uh, temporary workers in the agriculture, or they are future Canadian citizens. But then we have no migrants, so don't talk about you know migrants to us. It doesn't make sense. Um, so of course the concept itself is contested, and different countries have different ways historically, uh, politically, to frame their own uh, dynamics. And about migrant death, uh, we talk about migrant death. There's also the word border death, death at the border. Uh, we could at least, I mean, the different words. Um, um, Coexist, but I am interestingly speak about missing migrants, which is yet another topic, which leaves open the idea of whether or not they are they are dead. And there's interesting work being done. There was a very nice paper in the special issue I referred to about how the, the concept of missing or disappearing is very central uh, in, in many political contexts, especially, for example, in Latin America with the people who disappeared because of the dictatorships. Uh, so they were never really called dead. They simply you know, missing, disappeared. And there's big work done by the UN, for example, by human rights activists on disappearances, the extent to which you can apply this to migration could be very interesting. It's a very interesting venue for, for research. I mean, these are not people who didn't really die. They simply, you know, because, you know, being called dead re requires the government to acknowledge that you would die, that you are dead, right? And this is something governments sometimes don't want to do. They don't want to acknowledge the death uh, because it's their responsibility or because they want to leave it open, so to say. And so therefore people are missing or disappeared. But that, that's actually uh, yet another way of framing the, the, this issue in terms of the terminology. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Carolina, you've got a question. Yeah, you get to yes, put thanks. Your... Yes, I hope you can hear me. Uh, thank you very much for organizing this seminar. Um, I find, Antoine, your, your analysis of the IOM very convincing. Uh, but I would like you to come back to the way the IOM collects data. Uh, do they do like United or like Gabriela del Grande? Uh, that's my first uh, quick question. And the second is, uh, if there is any relationship between uh, their data gathering uh, with the so-called official lists, and I'm thinking here, for example, of the one produced by the by, by the commissioner Piscitelli in in Italy, for example. Thank you. Yes, that that's a good question. Actually, it's very difficult to understand how they count uh, the death. Uh, so I, I haven't done interviews with IOM people, but me, I mean, colleagues, co-writers have done interviews with IOM people. So basically, they're not very clear about this. Uh, they, the thing is that they have a wide network of regional local offices, and they work with all kinds of local partners, NGOs, press, associations, and that's how they claim to collect uh, the data. But as far as I know, there's no standard way uh, they work. They basically ask their local colleagues to work and collect the data. And people kind of know, it's a kind of bricolage, so to say. Uh, people locally gather data the way they can, sometimes relying on lists provided by NGOs, uh, sometimes providing other types of, of data. Uh, so it's very unclear. And I think that you know, if you want to take statistics seriously, those statistics are, I mean, almost totally meaningless because they simply sort of you know, pick up information here and there. And uh, they have no resources to actually, you know, carefully document every single death and check whether it was a migrant death or a border death or whatever. Um, so I think those numbers have to be understood as simply, you know, kind of artificial construction. But I think with such a topic, it's inevitable I mean, because, as I said, the definition is so broad potentially uh, that you never know what to put inside the category, and lots of people simply die without being noticed. So obviously, you know, 
gathering this information will require huge efforts, huge resources. Um, this is what you know, the Red Cross would like to do, actually investigating specific cases, understanding what happened very specifically to one specific migrant. But IOM do not, does not have the resources, it does not want to do that. I think largely it wants to occupy the space uh, by providing its uh, data. But from the making of the data is fairly uh, unconvincing, I would say. But I guess this also applies to NGO data. I don't think you can really have accurate data, especially because, as I tried to say, to say you have no specific precise categories. So it's very difficult to have precise data if you don't know exactly what, you, what you're talking about. And about the second question in relationship to uh, other lists, um, actually, I don't, I mean, I know that you have more and more lists that have been you know, produced and more and more people and governments and associations and uh, media uh, groups that have produced their own data, but I'm not, I, uh, honestly, I don't really know how IOM relates to these different initiatives. Um, I, they probably use it, but I don't think they would acknowledge that they use it. So it's a fairly uh, in-between situation. That, that's, that's my guess, but I, I, honestly, I don't know exactly. Um, how they, they relate or rely on a competing list, so to say, or local list at the level of the country or of a specific uh, region. Also because they have, you know, as I said, something I perhaps did not stress enough, they have a worldwide perspective, even though they acknowledge that this was largely a reaction to the EU Mediterranean crisis, uh, but nevertheless, they try to have a worldwide perspective. And obviously the resources you have to work on this in Indonesia, for example, not the same that the ones you have in the US-Mexico border or the one you have in Greece. Uh, so they try to actually produce global data uh, out of countless, very different uh, local uh, situations. Uh, that's the, but that's actually the, 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 the very nature of, of UN data or global data. It's always sort of producing global statistics out of situations that are hardly comparable uh, on the ground because they come from very different contexts and very different uh, countries and, and so on. Mm -hmm. So I'm sorry I cannot re reply specifically to the question, but uh, indeed that, that, that would be very interesting to look at the local local manufacturing of this data at a country level or in a specific region. That would be quite quite interesting to, to, to look at. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Any other question? Yeah. Uh, Rashid, Rashid Walalal. Yes, okay. Thank you for your presentation, which I also found very interesting. I had basically one question, but I think you gave part of the answer just now with your comments. Um, when you the website and the project mentions the missing migrants, it means both people who are dead and the bodies were found, but also by the collaboration of people who are disappeared in the sea for example and who are yes. um, okay so yes, I yes okay so i understand yes, the issue. yes. The yes i think often i mean that's inevitable because you have for example testimonies one we have one survivor shipwreck that says well, there was 50 people on the boat and they were all died of course the, the, the bodies will never be found uh, but the survivor will tell about this and the data will be based on what the survivor tells um, but indeed you have other sources that look only at those that were uh, the, the, the corpses that were identified and they reach much lower figures uh, obviously because most people simply go they, they disappear so to say. Mm -hmm. they die but without you know disappearing rather mm -hmm. okay thanks so but i had one question i found very interesting the three step moves you mentioned from the civil society to international organization and states so my question was is there some places in the world now where the this move has reached some states where we can start to check what's happening there or i mean is uh, there some I, I, I don't I, I i not that i know uh, not that i know um i think it i mean this is the kind of things that take a lot of time um so i'm not sure i mean not going i mean if you look at you know the history for example environmental concerns it started like in the late 40s in the in civil society but it took, you know, like, you know, 50 years to become really a state, uh, full state um, field of, uh, of policy. Uh, so I think this will take time. But as far as I know, no, uh, I haven't seen any. And of course, the problem is that the definition is not yet, uh, not yet finalized. And I guess they still have a lot of work and bargaining, discussion, negotiation between actors to reach a kind of shared uh, concept, uh, the definition that could be used. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So no, I, this may also never happen. I mean, I mean, it's simply you know, if you if you look at other issues, you may perhaps uh, conclude that this may happen, but it could also never happen. Uh, of course, uh, it's simply it's simply a guess. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, thank you. Any other question, reaction? Right. Um, okay. Apparently no. So, um, Judy, if you wanted to say a word to conclude the... Uh, um, I just um, I just wanted to announce maybe the um, uh, you know the rest I mean the the following um, seminars and webinars and say that we are really trying to build you know a network again I mean uh, we've been used to doing that with um, Thomas I mean there was the the diaspora network and then the ecotones uh, network so we've been you know working together um for several years now and so they these webinars in fact give quite a new dimension uh so as susan was saying on the on the private chat i mean this is definitely the um the upside of the lockdown uh i'm slowly getting reconciled with the whole idea of the webinars i was i was <laughs> very much against it at the beginning and now I, I can see some of the, you know, some of the positive points and, and positive effects. Uh, we are still thinking of those webinars uh, as we are waiting for the real thing. But, you know, it started off, I mean, in, in, uh, in such a dynamic and energizing way that maybe those, you know, webinars are going to, um, you know, to become, um, regular thing so we'll, we'll see how it develops uh it would be nice also for you to you know let us know whether you want to be associated with the uh, uh with the program and not only with the webinars uh so the next in fact speaking only of the webinar in the next one is going to happen on the 20th of november and so uh we've been trying to associate i mean you know, social sciences and humanities. So next one is going to be uh, Srilata, Srilata Ravi. Uh, so this is going to be a more literary one, but of course uh, it's not literature only as we all know. Uh, and in the same way, you know, just as the, the question on terminology um, also was pointing out, uh, we can't, you know, leave uh, social sciences alone, uh, obviously. So there is a lot of uh, you know, interaction. So we're looking uh, forward to uh, forward to that. Um, and Bidisha, you probably want to also say something about the, um, uh, or did you say something already about the time? The, the time, time and, yes. So apologies. There was some confusion today. I think uh, a few people signed on earlier because there was a bit of confusion about the GMT, which many people took to mean UK time. Uh, but of course, Britain is now on summertime until next Sunday. So there, there is a one hour difference, but there won't be a difference for our upcoming webinars because GMT and UK time will be the same. Uh, so for those of you in the UK, just a kind of uh, heads up about that. Um, apologies for the confusion. Um, so uh, we look forward to, to seeing you uh, at the upcoming seminar. Um, and thank you so much for joining us. Any, any final comments or questions or thoughts? Thank you so much, Antoine. That was, that was really interesting. Thanks to all of you. Mm -hmm. And you may, you may be interested to um, look into the, the publications as well about the, you know, the former uh, networks that we were working uh, on with Thomas. And there is, um, I mean, a forthcoming, you know, publication out of the Ecotones and uh, Corinne Dubois, uh, Marcus Arnold, uh, our co-editors, in fact. And so it's also on borders, uh, borders and ecotones, and it concentrates on uh, the Indian Ocean uh, this time. So some of you, I mean, you will see the, the publication being announced it should be a couple of weeks. Uh, so this is also you know, something to look forward to. So. Hi, everyone. Are you hearing me? Yes. Hello, Susan. Hi. 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 <laughs> Thank you enormously, Antoine and Judith. Excellent. Thank you so much. It was lovely to join you this morning, this afternoon, or whatever timescape you're in. <laughs> no, really great. Thank you so much. Antoine, you're at Paris 13. Yes, it's now called yes, Sauvignon. Uh, I'm at Paris 8. 
Yes, so we've um, opened uh, Saint Saint Denis. <laughs> that's it, and we have a European University project with the University of the Aegean on Lesbos. It's just starting this year. Okay. It will be interesting mm -hmm. to talk together to see oh, yes, what we can do with yeah, the yeah, students. Yeah. And I was just talking with Judith. We've really got to get the master students involved. Yes, um, great, the yes. opportunity yes. of these webinars is fantastic for our students. Um, now, I'm very excited about it. I really am. Um, if my reference to the uh, work by Dirk Herder was, uh, sorry, I, I was writing quickly, but <laughs> Dirk was one of our visiting professors at Paris 8 uh, so many years ago, but he's still a frequent visitor to Paris, uh, less so these days, but he's in the migration group at Condorcet. Does that ring any bells with you? Yes, 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 of course. Yes. I think we can, I think, you know, we can do lots of things together. Um, yes, no, with pleasure. <laughs> It's a happy circumstance, these yeah. um, these online meetings, it really is. Yeah. Yes, indeed, it's a positive side of the lockdown, absolutely, as, as you said. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think uh, Marois had, um, had a question. Yeah, we, yeah I think... Come on, raise your hand. <laughs> I'm raising my hand, I couldn't Please find the bottom. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, good morning, everyone. So thanks for this great presentation. Uh, so I'm a PhD student actually working with uh, uh, Dr. Misrahi Barak uh, and, um, and part of the IMA department and, and recently DEAR department in La Réunion. Um, I found the presentation quite outstanding, honestly. And, and it's a question that is um, currently, uh, it is always raised and some questions would not be, of course, uh, given any answers but we, we keep trying so you you've ended the presentation by talking about the rituals of death and the ceremonies and um i was a bit concerned because of course some most of the bodies were disappeared on on, on, the, on board or on, on the sea but for the bodies resting um is there any particular policies or respect or i would say not respect but um uh, the government are there any restricted uh, uh, policies or treatment uh, uh, particular from one country to another. It depends on, on the, 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 the nationality of this immigrant or mm -hmm. the country from which he or mm -hmm. she came from. Um, are there any differences uh, uh, when they treat the Well, when it comes to actually, uh, well, I was, I mean, I think when you talk about rituals, I mean, there are all kinds of rituals. Um, I was referring to rather to a kind of social political ritual in which you, you Give a meaning to to death at the sort of the political level, just like you would give a meaning, for example, to victims of terrorism. You give them a specific political meaning as victims of something, you know. Um, so uh, that's a kind of meta ritual, sort of, way, a uh, sort of national political ritual at the local level. Um, uh, I think Carolina has written a great paper on this, so I think she would better be much better positioned than me to answer this 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 question. But I don't think there's any kind of national policy in any government to address this uh, issue. It's really a kind of ad hoc uh, local actors uh, coping with the with the with the situation. And there we have actually a few papers uh, from Morocco, from Tunisia, in the special issue that actually deal with this. You know, how do you where do you what kind of cemetery do you use to to, to bury? those bodies, who takes care of that? Is it the church, the local government, the mayor, a small association, whatever. Uh, so I don't think there's a kind of national policy on this in any country. Uh, it's really something that, again, goes with the, the lack of data. Uh, as long as governments do not recognize that it exists, including from a statistical perspective, there's no specific sort of policy treatment of the, of, of the issue, uh, the only ad hoc uh, measures. Mm -hmm. So yes, that's a, for practical rituals. Uh, I haven't really worked on this, but I don't think there are any. And there are very good papers again in this special issue on precisely on those those rituals. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. I was just cons I mean, I was just mm -hmm. curious about because it's um it's quite tough. We we hear all the time stories about the those migrants who lost on the sea or her dad but their families couldn't recover them for for mm -hmm. years or they couldn't know anything about them. So. Thank you for, for answering. Mm -hmm. Thanks to you. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Uh, well, I think the uh, 
the seminar is coming to an end now. Um, ah, so there's uh, just, I think, someone yeah. asked for the, raise the hand. I just saw this on oh, the... There was someone else? Oh. Yeah. Jucle, I don't know who Jucle is, but uh, someone asked uh, the floor. I don't know. Sorry, I, I can't see. Actually, my name is yeah, Juliette Cluzu. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know why my name is not written uh, in the full letter. I don't know what I did when I registered on Zoom the first time. Uh, apologies for that. Uh, I just wanted a quick question. Actually, my question was a. Uh, uh, supposed to rebound on the last question we had by uh, Rashid, I think. Uh, it was about, first, thank you, uh, Antoine, for your presentation. It was uh, really interesting. I just, um, about your three step processes or uh, theoretical uh, process, process, I imagine, for this uh, uh, counting migrant deaths. Uh, project, I was wondering how uh, NGOs such as United, uh, for example, or maybe the Red Cross or ICRC uh, position themselves now that IOM is trying to occupy the space uh, in a very mm -hmm. deep politicized way. Uh, well, it was yeah. a bit of a diverging. Uh, yeah, that's a, that's a very good question. Um, well, I mean, the first thing to observe is that it's more difficult for them to get uh, funding or to actually, you know, keep uh, their efforts on this topic, uh, because to a large extent, you know, the, 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 the efforts are taken over by a much more powerful and resourceful uh, organization. So <clears throat> as far as I know, they have started to sort of, you know, working less on this, uh, on this topic. On the other hand, uh, and this is something actually my co-author, Charles, has been working on a lot, on the way of how to repoliticize the data, and he has been involved in the, in the research that actually uses the data uh, to measure very precisely um, the, 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 the death, I mean, the, the dynamics of migrant death across different uh, borders and border spaces. Um, and so, for example, using UHCL IOM data and arguing that, well, given that we have this specific data, if we use it in a very specific way, we can prove things uh, that uh, blame governments for not intervening, for example. So using this data, uh, arguing, well, if this data is reliable, then we sort of counter use it to show that uh, governments should have uh, acted on this very specific uh, shipwreck and this very specific day uh, and so on. So uh, to some extent, uh, he, I mean, he, I guess he would be the right person to answer the question, but in the last conclusion of our paper, we base, we, are, we, we refer to his work uh, in which he tries to sort of re-politicize the data or actually, you know, use, to, I mean, if you have reliable UN data on a topic, then you can actually use it to, uh, to say, well, we have good data, so we can actually show things that before could not be demonstrated because we had, you know, sort of weak, less legitimate NGO data. Uh, so it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's actually a different way of playing data, basically, not, not only connecting it, but using it, interpreting going to the details, looking at the specific list provided by IOM and using specific cases to show that you know, nothing was done on this specific death, for example, this type, this type of things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I'm not sure it answers the question, but actually, no, it, it's, it's in the... Yeah, in the yeah direction. it does. And actually, it refers to something that uh, we will publish on the blog of one of the anthropolo anthropological journal uh, that you probably know, Terrain, uh, will mm -hmm. publish very soon. So it's a short... Uh, blog paper, right? It's an academic paper, but from a designer who is working on the use of these new uh, of designers and uh, number experts uh, inside such arenas as international organizations and how deny, uh, people who know how to create uh, and visual data are used by the international organizations now as the new experts. So it might be interesting in this regard for you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it raises big issues in terms of indeed how you, uh, how you present the data and the skills, the kind of artistic skills you can have to, to showcase data, how this can be used yeah. also for political reasons, yeah. for sure. It's and a dilemma for- present themselves for, as, yeah. Yes. Self, it can self be a dilemma, yes. Yeah. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Yes. And just to mention that Juliette will be part of the, uh, the uh, webinar series uh, uh, next year, not this term, but next year. 
So you will tell me, tell us more about that. <coughs> Is there anyone I miss, I'm missing? Uh, can't see anyone willing to ask a question. No. There are a couple of people um, expressing interest in, in, in the presentation and wanting to be um, in the webinar series and wanting to be kept in the loop. So um, uh, please email um, uh, Thomas if you haven't, and he will add you to the, to the mailing list um, uh, of, uh, for the webinars. So thank you. And actually, that would be there would be. Um, I mean, you can declare interest uh, for the webinars, but also for the whole program. Yes. So if you're interested in the whole, you know, program, um, and we're also looking into, you know, developing it. I mean, further. So if you're interested, then you should send an email to the three of us, Thomas, Bidisha, and myself. <laughs>